What do you think warrants a life sentence? Let me know in the comments below. I'm your host Yusuf and these are 10 scary teenagers who are serving life sentences. Make sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Anyways, let's take it back, take it way back, take it way way back to the first criminal. Number 10, Lionel Tate. Tate was convicted of ending the life of Tiffany Eunuch by stomping on her so forcefully that her liver was lacerated. Her legs, feet, and neck all had serious bruises. An example of the amount of force used on her was similar to bruises from that of a speeding car. Her other injuries included a fractured skull, fractured rib, and swollen brain. These injuries were characterized by the prosecution as similar to those she would have sustained by falling from a three-story building. In sentencing Tate to life imprisonment, Judge Joel T. Lazarus of Broward County Circuit Court said that the acts of Lionel Tate were were not the playful acts of a child, the acts of Lionel Tate were cold, callous, and indescribably cruel. The sentence was controversial because Tate was 12 years old at the time of the crime, and his victim was 6. He was the youngest person in modern US history to be sentenced to life imprisonment, bringing broad criticism on the treatment of juvenile offenders in the justice system of the state of Florida. After the conviction, the prosecution openly joined Tate's plea for leniency in sentencing, and even offered to help in his appeal. The trial judge criticized the prosecution for compromising the integrity of the adversarial system, and said that if the prosecution felt that life imprisonment was not warranted, they should not have charged him with the crime in the first place. Number 9, Brian Lee Draper and Tori Adamchik. Brian and Tori were part of a two-man operation involving the execution of one of their classmates. They were both invited to the victim's house to watch a movie, but they devised a devious plan to ambush them. They were both interested in the idea of taking someone's life, so they started recording themselves while planning the execution. On a day when the victim would be alone and had invited them over to watch a movie, they left the house in the afternoon to collect weapons. They went back to the victim's house and waited for a fourth person who was invited to leave before cutting the power to the house, entering through an unlocked basement door, and executing the victim. They were eventually arrested and found guilty, both being sentenced to life in prison. Number 8, Josh Phillips. According to Phillips, on November 3rd, 1998, he was home alone when Maddie Clifton, who lived across the road from Phillips, came to his house asking him to come outside and play baseball. Phillips agreed, even though he was not allowed to have friends over while his parents were not home. As the two were playing baseball, Phillips accidentally hit the ball into Clifton's eye, causing her to bleed, cry, and scream. Phillips panicked, knowing his father Steve would be home soon and fearing his reaction. Phillips dragged Clifton into his house, saying that the clothing came off Clifton's lower body as he did so. He hit her with the baseball bat to stop her from screaming before putting her under the base of his bed. When Steve returned home, Phillips interacted with him for a period of time before returning to his room. When Phillips discovered that Clifton was still alive and moaning under his bed, he removed the mattress, cut her throat, and stabbed her in the chest seven times with a knife from a Leatherman tool, ending her. Phillips was tried as an adult. The trial was moved from Duval County, Florida to Polk County over concerns about the publicity in Jacksonville. Phillips' lawyer, Richard D. Nichols, did not call a single witness for the defense, a move the prosecutors later said was a surprising and risky strategy. Nichols intended to base much of the defense on a closing argument to the jury, where he stated Clifton's demise was an act that began as an accident and deteriorated through panic that bordered on madness. According to Phillips, Nichols never attempted to question him over the events of the execution and only played chess with him when visiting him in prison prior to the trial. Melissa Phillips disagreed with Nichols' strategy, though Steve insisted on letting the lawyer do as he pleased. Nichols discouraged Phillips' parents from allowing him to testify. Accordingly, Phillips never spoke during his trial. The trial started on July 6, 1999 and lasted only two days, an unusually short time due to the defense calling no witnesses. Jurors took just over two hours to convict Phillips of first degree execution. He was later sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He was not eligible for the demise penalty as he was under 16. Number seven, Eric Smith. On August 2nd, 1993, when Smith was 13 years old, he was riding his bike to summer camp in a local park day camp. Four-year-old Derek Robbie was walking alone to that same camp. Smith saw Robbie and lured him into a nearby wooded area. There, Smith strangled him and dropped a large rock on his head. 
Smith took Kool-Aid from Robbie's lunchbox and poured it into Robbie's open wounds. The cause of demise was determined to be blunt trauma to the head with contributing asphyxia. At around 11 a.m., Robbie's mother, Doreen, went to the park to pick up her son, only to find that Robbie had never arrived. After four hours of investigation, Robbie's body was found. The execution case made national headlines, largely due to the age of the butcher and of the victim. On August 8, 1993, Smith confessed to his mother that he ended Derek. The Smith family informed law enforcement later that night. Smith was subjected to extensive medical testing from specialists on both sides. They examined brain function, hormone levels, and found nothing to explain his violent behavior. According to court documents, Smith was a loner who was often tormented by bullies for his protruding low-set ears, thick glasses, red hair, and freckles. Number 6. Kenneth Taylor Kenneth Young was just 14 years old when his mother's substance dealer forced him to participate in a series of armed robberies. Kenneth was caught, convicted, and sentenced to four consecutive life sentences, a juvenile thrown behind bars with no chance of release. A flicker of hope arrived in 2010 when the US Supreme Court ruled in Graham v. Florida that it is unconstitutional to sentence a child to life in prison without parole for a non-execution crime. Because of his youth, loyalty, and lack of maturity, he refused to testify against others. He was convicted and given three life without parole sentences and he was told that he would pass away in prison. Number 5 Evan Miller In reviewing his case, the US Supreme Court banned mandatory life without parole sentences for juveniles, saying judges and juries should consider the special factors of youth, a decision that eventually led to inmates across the country getting a chance at release. But Miller will not get that chance. A judge handed down a second life sentence without possibility of parole. Lawrence Circuit Judge Mark Craig ruled that Evan Miller, despite being a young teen when he committed his crime, met the legal criteria to be sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Craig said the severity of Miller's crimes outweighed the mitigating factors of Miller's age and his abuse-filled childhood that the defense argued made him deserving of an opportunity of a chance to get out of prison someday. Number 4. Quantel Lots when Quantel Lotz was 17, he put together a makeshift tattoo gun using the motor of an old Walkman cassette player and a stylus fashioned from a sharpened staple. Then he asked a fellow inmate to etch two words in gothic script down each of his outer forearms. On his right arm, he wrote D-E-A-D, -E and on his left arm, he wrote man. That's how I felt at the time, like I was already gone, he says. He had just been handed down the most severe punishment, short of execution, possible in America. He was tried as an adult for a slaughter he committed when he was 14 and 21 days old and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He will remain in jail until he passes away. Now 26, Lot has seen his tattoos blur slightly, but his punishment remains as sharp as the moment the jury pronounced him guilty. Under the terms of his sentence, he will never stand before a parole board, never have the chance to reveal how much he's changed, never be able to show that the impulsive kid who ended his stepbrother in an adolescent fight 12 years ago no longer exists. He will never be free. They locked me up and gave me life without. It's like they ended all hope for the future. There's nothing left. Number 3. Carol Cole at age 8, he retaliated against one of his classmates, a boy of the same age named Duane, by drowning him in a lake in Richmond, California. The execution was regarded as an accident by authorities until Cole confessed to it many years later in an autobiography he wrote in prison. During a press interview, Cole said of this event, I was primed. I had made the mental commitment I was going to get, even with my mother, and things just built up and built up and became an obsession. As a teen, Cole committed several petty crimes and was frequently arrested for drunkenness and minor thefts. After high school, he joined the US Army, but was given a bad conduct discharge in 1958 for stealing pistols. In 1960, Cole attacked two couples parked in cars on a lover's lane. Soon afterwards, he called the police in Richmond, California, where he was living, and told them that he was plagued by violent fantasies involving strangling women. On April 9, 1981, Cole was convicted of three slaughters. He was sentenced to life at the Huntsville prison. In 1984, Cole's mother passed away and his attitude was reported to have changed. He agreed to face further slaughter charges filed in Nevada, even though it could possibly mean the execution penalty. Number 2, Derek and Alex King. On November 26, 2001, Derek, accompanied by Alex, beat his father to removal with an aluminum baseball bat. The boys then set fire to the family's home in Cantonment, Florida, in hopes of concealing their crime. 
Ricky Chavez, a family friend, was convicted of being an accessory to the execution after he hid the boys in his trailer home after the patricide and washed the blood from their clothes. Terry King was 40 years old at the time of his passing. The boys claimed that they committed the execution to end mental abuse, including being stared down and spanked. They would change their testimony several times, first claiming that they had ended their father on their own, then that Chavez had convinced them to end Terry, and finally that Chavez had executed Terry King and convinced them to take the fall. Alex also testified that he had been having a relationship with Chavez. In an unconventional move, the prosecution tried both Chavez and King brothers for the same crime. Chavez was acquitted, and while a second degree execution conviction was obtained for the King brothers on September 6, 2002, the judge threw the conviction out because he believed that the boys' right to due process was violated. The prosecution and defense resolved the case in mediation, avoiding a new trial. Both brothers pleaded guilty to third degree slaughter in November 2002. Number 1. Control Jackson Control Jackson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole when he was just 14 years old for his involvement in a 1999 Arkansas convenience store robbery that resulted in the execution of a store clerk. Jackson was charged as an adult and convicted of first degree execution, even though he did not physically commit the crime himself. According to court records, Jackson and two older accomplices went to the store with the intention of robbing it. One of the accomplices shot and ended the store clerk during the robbery. Jackson was charged with the crime based on the theory of complicity, which holds that a person can be held responsible for a crime committed by another person if they participated in the crime in some way, such as by acting as a lookout or encouraging the other person to commit the crime. At his trial, Jackson's attorneys argued that he should not have been tried as an adult and that he did not intend for anyone to get hurt. However, the judge allowed the prosecution to present evidence that Jackson had previously committed other crimes and had a violent history of behavior, which was used to support the argument that he was a dangerous person who deserved a life sentence. Control Jackson has been cited as an example of the harsh sentences that can be imposed on minors who are tried as adults, and as evidence of the broader issues with the state juvenile system in the United States. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and comment if you enjoyed this one, and we'll see you next time on Crime Time.